Hi, everyone. Can you all hear me? Please say hello so I know you can hear me. Okay, okay, hi. <laughs> now I can see. Great. Is the audio okay? Great. I'm so happy to be here. Where are you guys from? Can you type your locations? Goiânia, São Paulo, Santa Catarina, Peru, Maceió, Cotia. Excellent. Great. All right. Nice to meet you too. It's great to be here. Thank you very much for being here too. Uh, thank you, Giselle, for the opportunity. I'm Larissa. I'm an academic consultant at Troika. Um, Troika is a company. We offer lots of uh, interesting courses focused on the professional development of teachers and other fields of education. So uh, please visit our website. You can see on the top of the screen, Explore Troika. Click here. Uh, it's going to direct you to our website, and there's a lot of interesting stuff there. And today, we're going to talk about young learners and teens, topic that I like a lot. One of my favorite age groups, two of my favorite age groups to teach, so I enjoy a lot talking about them. And I really hope um, I'm able to share with you some of what I've learned throughout uh, the years I've been teaching and help you with some interesting insights and ideas so your practices can also be improved. All right. Okay. So let me show you uh, what is the plan for the webinar. We're going to begin by looking at some of the main natural characteristics of young learners and then some practical ideas on how to deal with them and, and to make our, our lessons more effectively, more effective, I'm sorry. Then we're gonna look at teenagers, again, some of the main characteristics and some practical ideas again. We're gonna look at both age groups in contrast and observe and analyze um, how they relate, what is common between um, two of uh, the, the, the age groups, the two of the age groups. And then uh, at the end, we're gonna look at the difference between natural characteristics and disruptive behavior. All right. Um, if you have any questions or any comments or contributions, they're more than welcome. I'll just ask you to hold them to the end. We're gonna save some minutes and open for questions and then we can address each of them. There will be moments in which I'm going to ask for your participation and for your contribution. So please um, make sure you, you, you share some of your ideas with us so we can exchange our, our experiences. And this is it. Let's go. So before we start talking about young learners, I would like you to reflect and, and try to think of, of what can be common between both of the age groups. So do they have anything in common? And if so, what? What do you think teenagers and young learners might have in common? In common? How are they similar? Can you type, please? So I can get to, to know some of your thoughts. They like to play. Mm -hmm. Both of them want what they want, how they want. <laughs> All right. You're curious. Okay, agreed. Impatient. They learn through games. Learn by doing, like games. Dynamic classes. Anxious. Easily bored. Technology. Mm -hmm. Normally, they don't like studying. Okay. Energy, definitely. Interaction. Short attention span. Excellent. Thank you very much for your contributions. Lots of interesting ideas. 
please hold those ideas because further uh, at some point during the webinar i would like to get back to it when we contrast both age groups and we're going to check um we're going to compare what you thought at this moment to what uh, will be in our minds um later on so hold that and we'll get back all right thank you again for your contributions moving on let's talk about young learners so if you teach young learners when you when you think of them what comes to your mind what adjectives cross your mind how would you describe what are they like in your lessons young learners only movement energetic full of energy <laughs> mm -hmm. let's imagine think of your kids and what are the adjectives that cross your mind mm -hmm. they're scary right <laughs> talkative A box of surprise. I like that, Luciana. Curious. Willing to learn. Creative. Not afraid to make mistakes. All right. Okay, thank you. Thank you. You can you can keep going. I'll just move on, but risk takers, I love that. Mm -hmm. They're very brave, spontaneous, right. Let me show you some of the main natural characteristics of young learners. So definitely, as many of you mentioned, they are curious. They are naturally curious about the world they live in. They want to know why. They want to know the what's. They want to know how things work. And this, um, this natural feature of young learners, it is actually a very powerful tool for us as, as educators, because we can use that to involve them in the activities we propose and in, in all the dynamics involved in our lessons. So when we plan our lessons, besides planning what the activities will be and the sequence in which they will happen, it is also very important that we plan how we are going to make our students curious about what we have to show. What are the questions we are going to ask them to introduce the topic and tease them a little bit and make them interested and get them engaged? This is something very important to be planned because then if we have this very clear in our minds, we can use their curiosity as, again, a very powerful tool to get them involved and to get them curious and to get their interest. So definitely curiosity is a, a, a very uh, uh important characteristics when we talk about kids yes they are easily bored and some of you also mentioned that and this is absolutely true this happens because they have short uh, short attention spans so it's absolutely natural at this point when you're talking about kids aged three to six or seven their attention spans are short but it gets uh, longer as time goes by and as they develop so it is true that they lose interest in activities quite easily and it's not because they're not uh, interested in what we have to show or they don't care or they're trying to, to test your patients that's not true this is only because their brains are not prepared yet to stay focused on the same thing for longer periods of time this is absolutely normal um, they are developing the ability to share, accept rules and take turns. Also true. If we think about it, the, the first uh, social experience kids have after their families, outside their families, is at school. So this is when they begin to get in touch with other kids. They begin to work in groups. They understand that they have to share materials. They have to share the space. They have to share the attention of the teacher, the attention of their colleagues. And this is all new. It's a brand new world. Because maybe at home, if they have no, no siblings, they, they, they wouldn't have to, to, to share anything. And then when they go to school, this kind of experience begin to, begins to, to, appear, to appear. So 
they're learning. They are beginning to get in contact with the, this kind of social interaction. And the same goes for rules and for taking turns. They, they begin to understand what rules are and the fact that rules exist and that they have to be respected. And this might seem complicated at some point somehow, but it actually it's actually good because as they are beginning to understand what these important concepts are, it is a very good moment for us to guide them through this process and shape their understanding in a way that they know how to act in certain moments. So these are abilities that they begin to develop. And as educators, we have a very important role there. Uh, kids often test people. Is that true? Yes, it is. They do test people, especially adults. But this is not because, again, they are being disruptive or they are trying to, to test our patients. Um, as they are beginning to understand what rules are, they are also beginning to understand that usually there is someone in control in most situations. And when they identify that someone is in control, they want to test this person because they want to learn the limits. It's the genuine sense of the word testing. They just want to understand how far they can go they just want to understand what the limits are. They're actually asking for answers. So when they test, they're not testing our patients or they're not, they're not testing our limits. They are actually testing their limits. So they can shape their own behavior, their own actions. And this is when they start seeking for approval, which is our next item. They seek for approval because they are beginning to understand what is right and what is wrong. What is acceptable behavior, what is not acceptable what make people happy and what doesn't. So how do they know if they are doing something nice if we don't tell them? So when they seek for approval, it's not necessarily because they, they are needy or they want to call the attention. It's just because they need to understand if what they're doing is right, if it's being appreciated, if they should do more of that, or if not, if this is not something nice and they shouldn't do it anymore. So they seek for approval because they're trying to get the right answer. All right, they need directions. Great. More people coming. Hello, Ivechi, Simone. Hello, Stella. Let's move on. So now that we know young learners a little bit better, let's take a look at some ideas that can help us in the classroom. Um, how can we adapt our lessons and our practices in a way that we take into consideration their needs and all the changes they are going through? Uh, routine charts. I don't know if you're all familiar with routine charts. Let me explain what it is. This can be done on the board or on a piece of post paper. And because they are very curious, every day when they arrive at school, they want to know what's going to happen. So they want to know what the activities will be, what the lessons will be like, will there be any games, what are we going to do? And from curiosity comes anxiety at times. And a way to help them feel less anxious is to provide them with the answers they are looking for. So if they are curious about what the day will be like, why not provide them with these answers? Routine charts are a way of doing that. So a great idea is to begin the day, to every day, every lesson, begin the lesson with a class meeting in which students get familiar with the activities for the day, the sequence in which they will happen, and they can participate. If you produce cards that they can uh, hang in a sequence for the activities, or you can leave a blank space in the chart for them to negotiate or to vote for an activity they want to do. This will provide them with the answers they need because they just want to know what's going to happen. And it will bring them uh, to their, uh, as active participants in their own learning process and routines. So routine charts, they usually work very well, lowering students' uh, anxiety at the beginning of the school day. Collaborative activities are also a very great strategy uh, when we're talking about developing social abilities. Again, they are learning 
to respect rules, their learning, to socialize, to share, um, and working collaboratively, working in groups and having to, to share the responsibility and the work to come to a final uh, uh, common result is an excellent way of developing these abilities because if they work in groups, they will have to share the work, they will have to share the responsibilities, they will have to share the materials, they will have to take turns, they will have to find a way to share that space. So all these abilities become um, more uh, better developed and shaped. And the options, the, the ideas are endless. Um, they can produce posters, they can uh, create a choreography for a song, they can present a theater play about a story you, you told them the other day. They can make a market. One will sell the products, the other will uh, buy the products, the other will be in the package station. They can produce collages. They can do a number of different activities working collaboratively. So this is a very great strategy to help them share and to help them develop uh, abilities like sharing, respecting rules, and other important social concepts. Uh, sensory activities. We know that children, they do learn a lot through, our sense, through their senses. So bringing their senses to be used in the lessons can make the learning experience, experiences more memorable. For example, if you're teaching foods, um, you can bring some different kinds of food blindfold your students and then have them taste different items and they should guess what they're eating or if you're teaching temperature you can bring ice cubes and cups with water in different temperatures and as they touch or place their fingers into the cups they name the temperatures this will make the experience more memorable and more effectively right yes yeah, simone they enjoy a lot i agree I have worked with this age group a lot, and every time I brought food or water in different temperatures and, and they had to explore their own senses, they engaged a lot. I agree. A relaxing corner. A relaxing corner can be something really, really useful, especially in groups where there are students who have a hard time controlling their feelings. Um, it's all about setting a, a place, a space in your classroom, and there you can put different relaxing tools. I'll give you some examples. Um, glitter bottles, those anti-stress pressing balls, air balloons for them to fill up, uh, white uh, blank sheets of paper for them to draw, cushions, and then you agree with the group that whenever someone feels frustrated or upset or angry or anxious and it gets really hard for them to calm down by themselves, this person can go to the relaxing corner and then press the ball, draw something, or just lie down for a while, fill up the balloon because they will breathe. This is a way of respecting their feelings because it's absolutely normal. Everybody feels this way at times and it's okay. It's part of life, but then we are helping them to deal with it. We're helping them to find ways of controlling their feelings and recovering by themselves. This can do wonders. It's a, it's a really, really uh, powerful uh, strategy, relaxing corner. Short instructions and activities. So, as we know, they do have short attention spans. This is for a fact. So what can we do in order to help them cope with the activities and the tasks without losing interest that easily? Break uh, the, the instructions and the activities down into shorter steps, smaller steps. So instead of telling students, OK, you're going to draw, then you're going to color your drawings, and then you're going to cut them out, and then glue them in your notebooks. This is too long. You have four steps within one activity and probably by the end of the first one, they will be distracted. So a way of breaking this whole activity into smaller steps is tell them to draw, allow them some minutes. When they finish drawing, now you're going to color. 
when they finish color, then you tell them to cut it out. And finally, you let them know they should glue it. If the whole activity is, break, is broken into smaller steps, they will be allowed to focus on small bits of the same task at a time. And then they will be more concentrated and you will observe that less students uh, lose interest and get bored before the end of the task. So short instructions and shorter activities, we, they can help us there. Praise and validate positive behavior. Again, they are looking for answers. They want to know if what they're doing is right or not. So how can we know that? How can they know that? If we tell them. But more often than not, we tend to focus and emphasize what we don't want our learners to do. So instead of emphasizing what they're doing positively, we keep saying what we don't want them to do. So we say, don't be late. Don't mess around. Don't shout with your colleague instead of saying, very good, you spoke in a very nice volume. Thank you, congratulations, you finished the task within the time limit. So whenever we validate and we praise positive behavior, instead of telling them what we don't want them to do, we are shaping their behavior and we are helping them to understand what we want more of them, right? But then, um, talking about praise, Carol Reed says that when used effectively, praise is a powerful way of building up children's self-esteem and maintaining healthy, trusting relationships. Praise can also play a significant role in managing children's behavior in a positive way. So, how exactly can we praise effectively? Can praise ever be ever be not effective what is that about let's look at the two types of praise uh, on top of the screen we have judgmental praise and descriptive praise the first one judgmental praise it's about empty praising so this is when and this is very easy it's very tricky and very easy to get the habit of praising all the time we are all the time repeating positive words but without really telling them why so all the time the teacher is saying, very good, excellent, great job, congratulations. But we're not telling them what they're being praised for. We're not explaining what they did that we are praising them. So this becomes empty and it becomes judgmental because we establish for them that as the teacher is all the time saying kind words, when the teacher is not, it means that I'm doing something wrong. That's how the student understands that. So if the teacher is not all the time saying, great, very good, excellent, they understand they're doing something wrong. So all the time they are being judged or they are doing something nice or if there's silence, there are no kind words being said by the teacher, it means they are doing something wrong. This is not effective. But when we use descriptive praising, on the other hand, we are doing the opposite. Then we are informing our students why they are being praised. So we say, congratulations, you did your homework every day this week. Great job, you didn't mess around. Thank you for not shouting. Excellent, you're speaking in a very nice volume. So then they understand why they're being praised. We allow them to comprehend what is positive about their attitude. And it's a very um, effective way of shaping their behavior and making positive behavior more and more consistent. So keep in mind that descriptive behavior, uh, sorry, descriptive praise, the kind of praise that informs the reason why someone is being praised will always be more effective than judgmental praise, the empty kind. All right. So now let's talk about teens. Again, as we did in the beginning, when I asked you to share some of your impressions about the, teen, uh, the young learners, let's do the same thing about the teens. Can you please type some of the adjectives that cross your minds when you think of your teenagers? What are they like? What are their characteristics? Impatient, self-conscious, okay. What else? 
talkative, fun, way too confident, difficult. Talkative and curious, okay. Fear of making mistakes, impulsive, easily distracted, don't always want to participate, that's true. They love sharing. Fear of being judged, absolutely. All right. Very interesting ideas again. Thank you very much. So now it's time to take a look at some of their natural characteristics. Let's analyze the teenagers. Some are too quiet, Tatiana. That's true, and we're going to look at this. We're going to we're going to find out why. Okay. So they want to be respected. That's true. Everybody does, right? Everybody wants to be respected, but sometimes teenagers they don't really know how to 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 seek for this respect to ask this kind of respect that they are looking for. The thing is, it's a very confusing moment for them because they're not children anymore, they're not adults yet, they see they're changing physically and in all other ways, and they're just trying to understand who they are becoming. So because they are lost in this process at times and they don't really know who they are and who they are turning into, it gets a little bit hard for them to make sure people still see them and still hear them. So do, do they know who I am? Do they respect my feelings? That's the kind of question that often comes to their mind. So this is why they seek for respect a lot, because they are confused about who they are and how people see them as well. They have a heightened sense of what is right and what is wrong. Again, they are becoming different people. They are coming from children on the way to become adults, but the process is not that fast. And during adolescence, things become a little bit blurry and they're not sure where they, st they stand um, for a while. And because they are building their identity and learning who they are, about who they are becoming, um, they are very critical about people's attitudes and their own attitudes. They are all the time questioning the validity of uh, what people do and what they do. So this is why they have a very um, sharpened and high tense sense of what is right and what is wrong. And they are always questioning the validity of people's actions, including, including their own, because they are um, building their values and their principles as well. They enjoy express themselves, yes, but as long as the topic is relevant for them. You will see later on that they are kind of self-centered and there is a reason why, there is a, a cognitive reason for them to be this way during adolescence. And this is what causes their lack of interest in topics that are not relevant for them. So yes, they do enjoy expressing themselves, but we have to be careful with the topics we choose. What do we want them to express themselves about? What do we want them to react about? Uh, teenagers may be unsure of their personal value and capacities. Again, it's a period of confusion. A lot of insecurity and uncertainty comes in. They're not sure about their intelligence. They, they, they even question their intelligence and their abilities. So this is why sometimes, as some of you mentioned, they don't want to participate much because they don't want to take the risk of being judged or of saying something that their colleagues consider stupid. They become insecure. They become very insecure. So when they, they prefer to be quiet and not to, to, to participate or to react, to answer in public, to talk in front of the others, this is because they are facing a period of a lot of insecurity and uncertainty. It's a natural process that they go through. And yes, they are self-centered and emotional. We know that there is a thrill of hormones happening during adolescence and their feelings, they become very unstable. So it's hard for them to control their emotions and they can often have um, emotional bursts for no big deal, apparently for no reason, but it's just because for them 
um, the, the hormones and all the, the emotions, they are kind of a mess, okay? And they are self-centered because their brains, they are under development. We tend to believe that kids' brains are under development, but then when we come to adolescence, we are fully developed, uh, talking about our brains, but not necessarily. And we're going to look at this uh, right now in a minute. Um, Sarah Jane Blakemore, she says that adolescence is defined as the period of life that starts with the biological, hormonal, physical changes of puberty, and it ends at the age at which an individual attains a stable, independent role in society. So this is a very strong statement. When exactly do we have this stable, independent role in society? That's a lot. Can we really expect teenagers to, to know how to behave all the time, to know how to express themselves? Is it the time for them to have this ability? So this is a, this is a quote by Sarah Jane, just for us to reflect a little bit and, and think of what we expect of them at times and what they are really prepared to offer in terms of attitude and behavior. Um, talking again about the teenage brain, uh, let's take a look at what happens in their brains uh, during adolescence. So the human brain is under development throughout the whole period of uh, adolescence. The prefrontal cortex, this red part you can see in the picture, it is changing all the time. And not only it's changing in shape, but also the amount of gray mass is being dosed. So think that things get really unstable during this period. And the prefrontal cortex, this part of the brain, is responsible for a number of very important uh, abilities that are not fully developed yet because the brain, the, the area of the brain that deals with these abilities is not. So let's take a look at some of them. The ability of, uh, of making decisions, the ability of planning, social interaction, self-awareness, and inhibiting inappropriate behavior, to name a few. So all these abilities, they are still being developed. They are still being constructed together with the prefrontal cortex that is being formed. So when we offer options for our teenagers and they seem to be not interest or not to pick any of the options or they want all of them, they don't want to pick and choose, they just want to get them all, it's not necessarily because they're spoiled. It is because they are learning how to make decisions. Their brains are learning how to decide. Or when we expect that they have a very well planned study routine and an agenda and everything very well organized and they don't, maybe it's not because they are not interested or because they are lazy. Maybe it's just because their brains are learning how to plan. So if you read uh, any of these abilities and you, and you remember, it, it reminds you of some of your students, something that you want them to do and they don't, maybe it's the time to, to reflect. Am I expecting something realistic from my teenagers, cognitively speaking? So some ideas, they're always welcome, right? How can we help? our teenagers to go through all this process full of confusions and great changes that is the adolescence. If you find shared interests and involve these interests in your lessons, it will make you closer to your students. And if we invest some extra time getting to know our students better, we will find something in common. It doesn't need to be something big. Maybe you like the same kind of music or you like um, the same kind of food, you like the same weather, you enjoy the same band, you like going to the same place in town, I don't know. But finding shared interests, common interests with your teenagers and involving these in your lessons will make you closer and they will see in you uh, someone they can relate to and it, it brings trust to the relationship.
Xbox, yes, PlayStation, uh -huh, they, yes. Okay, Be uh, memes, great. They are all the time laughing about the memes, so why not? We have to be realistic. We have to bring things that are interest for them and that are part of their context and their daily routines. Otherwise, it's not going to be interest, interesting. So yes, finding shared interests is very important so we come closer to them. Um, if you promote moments of negotiation and decision making in the lessons, it also makes a difference. Why? We know that they are learning how um, to make decisions. Their brains are learning. They are developing this. And also we know that they want to be respected as individuals. They are seeking for this respect. So when we offer them the opportunity to decide or to choose, we're actually helping them in both ways. We are helping them to practice the ability of deciding and we are bringing them as active participant, participants to their uh, own learning processes. So if they decide, they feel respected, they feel considered. And I'm not talking about big decisions. We're talking about deciding if they're going to work in pairs or individually, deciding the topic of uh, what they're going to write about. Small daily decisions, they do make a difference. Foster an environment of trust and respect. Well, again, they are going through a lot of insecurity and uncertainty. They don't want to, to take the risk of being judged. They avoid being exposed. So the more we encourage an environment of collaboration, an, a supportive classroom environment, environment, and we allow them the chance to help each other and to respect each other's uh, differences and particularities, the safer they will feel. This is really important. And bring topics that are relevant for them. Well, as we talked before, they are self-centered. They are still developing the ability to relate to others and to put themselves in someone's shoes and to see things from other people's perspectives. So it's much easier to get them involved and interested in topics that are relevant for them because at this point, they are naturally more self-centered and focused on what is important for them. So this will help uh, to engage and to involve uh, in the activities, all right? Well, remember that in the beginning, I asked you to find something in common between young learners and teenagers. So the time to look at these similarities has come. Let's take a look. They seem to be very different, but you'll see that they have more in common than we think. While young learners are learning to deal with emotions, teenagers are also having trouble controlling their emotions. They can have emotional bursts, their hormones are a mess, so they have this in common. Kids need reference, they need guidance. Remember, when they test us, they're actually looking for reference and for guidance. And teenagers, they're also looking for role models. They're shaping their personalities and they're trying to find uh, someone to inspire them. Young learners engage with topics that relate to their personal experiences and daily routines. And the same go for, goes for teens. They engage in tasks that are meaningful for them. They are self-centered. Young learners seek for praise and for validation. And teenagers need reassurance of their intelligence and capabilities and capacities because they are uncertain and doubting their own abilities as we said before why because both age groups still have their brains being developed and it's very tricky because as teenagers are taller and sometimes they're even taller than us and they have um, th their physical appearance more developed than children we tend to think that they are more prepared, they're better prepared for some situations, that they, they have some abilities fully developed uh, in relation to kids. But actually, they don't. They still need a lot of guidance. They still need a lot of support. They still need our help and patience because they are still learning and they are still getting used to the new person they are becoming and it is a tough moment. So we have to consider that they don't have many 
of the abilities we expect them to have, at least not fully developed. They need our help because they are in the process of developing these uh, skills. And this brings us to my main point today. What I really, really, really want um, you to take from this webinar. We have to be careful not to confuse disruptive attitude with natural behaviors. So it's very easy to confuse both of them because we are involved in the routine, we are tired, we have lots of students, lots of things to do. Sometimes they are messy, sometimes they are noisy, sometimes our patients get short. This is all true. But the thing is, much of, we, of what we consider disruptive attitude, much of what we look and, and see as disrespect is actually natural. It's actually part of their development. And when we learn that, when we understand that the natural processes and changes and necessities of each age group have to be taken into consideration, we can find better ways uh, to provide them with a happier and more effective learning experience. So it is our role as educators to learn more about what they go through, their cognitive processes, the abilities they are developing, their needs, and take all of it into consideration, uh, adapting our lessons and our practices in a way that we make this path smoothier for them. This was my objective today, to share with you a little bit of what I've learned throughout the years and what I think can help uh, you guys to improve your practice and to adapt and to, to have a healthier and happier relationship with your teams. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, if you have any comments, any considerations, they're more than welcome, please. Now it's a very good time um, for questions and for, for ideas you would like to share. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please, if you have any questions, if you want to give me some kind of feedback, um, what were your impressions? Um, any comments, any contributions are more than welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Sergio. Thank you, Rafael. Uh, I think so. I think it's going to be available. I think it will be. The cell phone, yes. But a, a way of, of using the cell phone in our favor is to bring the cell phone to class. So try to involve the cell phone into your practices. They can record themselves speaking English, presenting on TV show. Mm -hmm. All right. Special tools to use with kids and adolescents. Well, technology offers a lot of options. Um, Internet, they, they usually like um, watching videos. Someone mentioned the memes. Someone mentioned their own games. Um, whatever is hands-on, whatever keeps them busy and really involved and has a topic that is significant for them, will engage them. Class Dojo, very interesting. All right. They like the TED videos. Kahoot is very popular, but we have to know why we are using Kahoot. So what is the rationale behind? This is a topic for another conversation. But yes, Kahoot is very, very popular. They enjoy it a lot. OK. All right, guys. So please make sure you follow us uh, on Instagram, Troika Instagram. It's on the screen right now, troika.br. Uh, we do have a lot of interesting content. We have 
a number of courses, including courses to help you deal with teenagers and teens and a number of other topics that will be helpful. Um, if you're not familiar with our membership, please find out more about it. We offer exclusive um, advantages for members. So make sure you follow us on Instagram. Make sure you explore Troika in our web page. You just have to click on the link in red on top of the screen. You are more than welcome. Come visit us. Thank you. Teens can teach us how to use technology in class. They do. Sometimes they do know a lot more than us, and they help us a lot. That's true, Maristela. Totally agree. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. It was awesome. I was really happy. Mm. Sergio, do you think that it's effective to mix the class with students with age between 8 and 13? Well, there, there's a big difference there. I mean, it, it all depends on what you want to do, what are the dynamics. It, it can work. It can work, but it has to be very well planned and with a very clear uh, rationale behind what could work. Uh, about the certificates, uh, I'm not quite sure, but I think Giselle has this answer. All right. How would you deal with teens who keep interrupting the lesson? Well, it depends. How exactly do they interrupt? Why are they interrupting? Are they talking about the lesson, the topic of the lesson? Or is it because they're not involved? What exactly is the interruption about? They do, Samara. They enjoy teaching us about technology. Yeah, sometimes they do want to show off. Sometimes they have this, this kind of attitude, but we have to know that if they're doing that, they are seeking for attention and for some reason. So an honest talk, a respectful talk individually, only the teacher and the student, and frankly ask them what happens. Is there anything in the lessons that is not making you happy? Uh, what exactly do you miss? Uh, how can I make the lessons more interesting for you? So give them questions to be answered, but in a very mature way, in a very honest and respectful way, far from the colleagues, only the teacher and the student. I think dialogue is the key for most things in life, and this is not different. Not different. Yeah, I guess. I guess it has to do with not being engaged. So maybe ask them, what do you like to talk about? Is there a topic I could bring? Remember when we talked about knowing our students and finding shared interests? So maybe it's the case of uh, investing more time, getting to know this student, what makes them happy, what engages them, what they like doing their free time, and bringing more of it uh, into the lessons. This will probably help. But I, I still insist that an honest conversation, only the teacher and the student, uh, is always helpful. Really show you are interested in understanding the reasons why they behave this way and willing to bring something that is more interesting for them. So what can I as a teacher do for you to enjoy the lessons and let them answer? Thank you. Thank you, Priscilla.
Thank you, guys. Do you have any other questions? Anything else you would like to ask or to comment? Any ideas you want to share? Someone is typing. For little kids, the activities have to be short, right? Yes, they do have the short attention spans, as we said before. So the shorter the instructions and the activities, the better the chances of them staying focused until the end. So short instructions, short steps, short activities will help them focus uh, until the end of the task, definitely. How could we use video games in kids' classes? They love them. I'd like to take advantage of them. Maybe you don't use the video game itself, but you could use the characters of the video game. So I'm not very familiar with video games nowadays, but if you get familiar with the video games they play and the, the characters that are there or the scenario or any features from the games, you can bring activities that illustrate and, 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 and involve the features and, and the scenario and the characters, but not necessarily they are going to play the video game in class, but they will have elements of the game involved in the tests. This, this might um, be a good idea. Good, Maristela, I hope you try. Let me know if it worked. <laughs> Do you have any other questions, any comments? We have a very nice course about gamification here at Troika, so make sure you check our webpage and learn about this course. We offer a nice content on this uh, subject. You're welcome, Marisol. Hope it works. Hope it's helpful. All right, guys. So this is it. Thank you very much again for all the contributions, for being here. I hope it was helpful. Uh, I wait for you here at Troika. Come visit us. And you are more than welcome to, to come have some coffee and, and get to know us a bit better. Thank you very, very much. It was great being with you. And I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. See you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, Lillian. Bye-bye. Bye, George. Bye. Bye, Janaína. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. See you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Oops.
Bye, bye. Uh, I'm so glad, Viviane. I'm so glad it was helpful, really. I'm super happy. Thank you for being here, Evelyn. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. It was a pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.